Okay, now we're into chapters four and five, where we're taken up into the throne room of the Almighty God. So, first of all, let's look at some of the Old Testament occurrences of what we have seen so far of God on the throne. We'll look first at Isaiah 6, starting verse 1, where it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh Almighty. So that's the Isaiah record. Let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel is also very, very interesting. Ezekiel chapter one, starting verse four. An immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was that what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. And then for about the next 20 verses, it's all describing the four living creatures. So now we pick up back up on verse 25. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. And above the vaults over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his ways up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire. And that from there, down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. So that's the Ezekiel account. And then the last Old Testament account we'll look at is in Daniel, Daniel chapter nine, where it's recorded as I look. Thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair on his head was as white like wool. His throne was a flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words. The horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority. He is the Messiah, by the way. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So that's what we know so far. Now let's go to chapter four and enter in to the throne room of God. Now, before we do this, I want to at least outline 
where we are now in the book of Revelation. Okay, so we started out with the introduction, which is primarily captured in Revelation 1.1, so that it's the revelation of Jesus, it's the revelation from Jesus, in his revealed glory, power, and majesty. This was written to the saints, what must soon take place. And then John was instructed to what? Write seven letters to seven churches. This is God's dealing with the church. We had read in 1 Peter 4 that judgment is to begin with God's household before judgment on the world. So these letters were written to warn all churches in the church age of their strengths and weaknesses. The importance of deeds, remember, I know your deeds was repeated. Importance of overcoming the world to him who overcomes. Also, to expect hard times ahead, it's not gonna be easy, but to look eagerly for Jesus' second coming to establish his kingdom the kingdom of God, which is the gospel message. Now we're getting into God's dealing with the world. This is just the in its infant stage because it's gonna be orchestrated by Jesus and the counsel of God from his throne room in heaven, which we're fixing to go to. The plan, which is the scroll with the seven seals is being revealed and John is summoned to observe what's going on and to report back to the saints and churches. An awesome, awesome task, uh, considering he's got to put it in words. So let's go there. Revelation 4, verse 1. <clears throat> after this, I looked. So after this, I looked. That's another, what we had talked earlier, of a chronological textual marker. So after this, I looked. Now we're starting another scene, if it was a movie. And there before me, was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come on up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So the voice speaking like a trumpet, we've already read about that. That was identified in Revelations 1 verses 10, 11. We know that to be Jesus Christ. Now, I want to take a little time on this first because um, this is another key verse by the pre by those that believe in a tree pre tribulation rapture. Uh, the pre tribulationists they interpret this verse as the church being raptured into heaven, and the reason is because there's no longer any mention of the word word church in Revelation. You know we had Revelations. Uh, Two and three were right to the church, right to the church, the church, the church, the church, the church. Now John's being taken up and into heaven and we don't hear the church anymore. Not until Revelations 22, the last chapter. So they conclude that the church has been raptured out into heaven. But however, we had already discussed that John doesn't use the word church. He was instructed to write to the churches, so it's recorded as churches, but John uses the word saint. It's used 13 times between Revelations 5, 8 and 29. John's not known for using the word church in any of his other writings. Uh, the epistle of uh, first, second or third John or the gospel of John. He does not use the word church. Also, the church is never used in the classic rapture patch passages that the pre-tribulationists pre many times refer to, which is found in 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Corinthians 15 and John 14. And you can read that on your own. So what do we conclude, conclude here? It's only John. It's not the church that's invited into heaven. And he's not even raptured, but he's carried away into the spirit because after he sees what he sees, what happens? He returns back down to Patmos. So let's keep on going. There was a store, door standing open in heaven. Now this could be reminiscent of what Jacob saw in Genesis 28, where it says, he, he, being Jacob, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood Yahweh. And he said, I am Yahweh the God of your father Abraham, 
and the God of Isaac. I will show you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. So this is very much in parallel um, uh, with what was seen in Genesis 28. Now Jesus goes on to say, I will show you what must take place after this. And we know what the this is. This is what John is fixing to see. We're, so we're now jumping into the future, into future prophecy, a continuation of what was already, we were told in Revelations 119, what is now and what will take place later. So here's the challenge. What John sees challenges the ability of the human language to record and adequately describe the majestic grandeur of God and his throne room. I mean, a lot of this is just beyond human comprehension. And for him to see this the first time and remember, you know, he's not used to uh, graphic comic books like Marvels and, and whatnot. Uh, this is all brand new. So with that in mind, it's safe to say that what John saw and witness is beyond what words can adequately express. And so there's going to be times where we're going to, because he's challenged, we're going to be challenged to try to understand what he's seeing. Okay? What he's seeing. That's, that's very key. Not necessarily what it represents um, or what it means. And in particular, chapters four and five, the words, you know, even though he's got this big challenge, they're clearly articulated and they leave very, very little room for any interpretation other than what is clearly written. The plain interpret, uh, the plain uh, uh, meaning of the words as to what is going on. So <clears throat> let's now go to verse two. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven was someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. So what was the first thing that John sees? The first thing he sees that he records is, I see a throne, God's throne. This is the symbol of divine sovereignty. This is beyond a shadow of a doubt, the throne room of God. And he makes, he didn't even make an attempt to describe who's sitting on the throne, really, because it was probably just beyond description. I mean, what he saw, he was probably at a loss of words on how to describe such grandeur, such beauty, such majesty. He does use the words, Jasper and ruby in NIV, or diamonds and rubies in the complete Jewish Bible, or jasper stone and a sardis in NASB, or jasper and carnelian in ESV. So even the, the translators here were a little challenged with the Greek words. Uh, but what I found out is that the ancient understanding of jasper is a little different from what we modern day call jasper. Uh, in their minds, it had a diamond-like brilliance a diamond-like gem. Now, ruby or sardis, uh, that was a deep red gem. But also something very, very important here. There's a rainbow. Why would there be a rainbow? And it shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Now stop and think. The rainbow brings us all the way back to the days of Noah and God's promise to mankind. So in one sense, this rainbow could be seen as God's covenant to mankind. His covenant of his sovereignty, his judgment, his promises, as well as his mercy and his patience with man. So surrounding the throne, verse four, were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were what John called 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads, diadems. So 
This is pretty much all that the Bible discloses of these 24 elders. So we know there's 24 thrones. Uh, we know there's 24 beings called elders. They're always in the throne room. They're always associated with the four living creatures. They are involved with worshiping God in heaven. They are always distinguished from the saints. They are always involved with God's purpose on earth. And they seem to always know what's happening. Now, there are several theories, uh, speculations, uh, comparisons to uh, other references in the Bible. And for anybody that's uh, interested in going down those rabbit holes, and, and if you have the time, I, I highly encourage it. I do it all the time. So some of the possibilities, will they represent maybe the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles uh, chosen by Jesus? Um, you see the, the reference there, Revelations 21. Uh, another very interesting uh, comparison is the 24 courses of priests that served in the temple on rotation. Um, and so, yeah, you might have, uh, these might be representative of uh, more than 24 that's, that go on rotation in these, in these uh, thrones. Uh, and that's recorded in 1 Chronicles 24. And then possibly the first mention of these elders is found in Isaiah, Isaiah 24, 23. Uh, but that's as far as we're going to go. We're not going to uh, go down that rabbit hole today. We're going to continue on. Verse 5. <clears throat> From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So let's break this down. Flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals and thunder. What does that remind us of? Well, that reminds us of the experience we read in Exodus at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19.16, on the morning of the third day, there was what? Thunder and lightning with a thick cloud covering the mountain. Uh, and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. Uh, next chapter, 20, verse 18, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. So we've already experienced a little bit of this in the Old Testament. Now in front of the throne, there were seven lamps were blazing, and these are the seven spirits of God. Now, if you have not gone into my uh, lecture on chapter one from verses two to the end of the chapter, I highly recommend because we do discuss um, the seven spirits of God at length there. Uh, this is the Holy Spirit. Uh, and from that old lecture, um, we, we referred to the Holy Spirit as the menorah, the lampstand that was in the tabernacle. Remember, God said this, this is there to represent what is in um, the actual throne room. And so as the, as the lampstand has seven individual lamps, it's only one light. Just like what's explained here, there's seven spirits of God, but only one Holy Spirit. So I will leave that at that and we will move on. Also, in front of the throne, there is what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Now, first and foremost, it only looks like a sea. Remember, John is struggling, trying to figure out, what do I call this? How, how do I relate this? And what he's seeing is, is you know, clear as crystal, and it's flat. It's like, oh, like a flat sea, maybe. Uh, so, uh, one thing he definitely did not say, it doesn't look like a lake or a pond. I mean, this is a sea. This is huge. This is gigantic. So, uh, and it's like a clear glass floor that's beneath God's throne. And so, you know, we could kind of go, okay, well, what's that there? Is it, is it the court floor uh, that people come and approach God? After all, we got thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 that gather around him, or is it something else? 
Um, and this, I had on the surface, I, I, I said, no, that's not really it. But then the more I dug into it, the more I thought, well, hmm, maybe there's something here. Could it be a barrier keeping evil out of the heavenly courts? So in other words, you'd have like earth, the crystal sea, and the throne room. Um, and there's a couple of verses that kind of tie into this. Revelation 21.1, we see that the new heaven and new earth no longer has a sea. And that's mentioned purposely by name. Uh, Revelation 21, 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. So is it actual sea or the crystal sea? We're not sure. Note uh, the sea is where the beasts rise out. And Revelation 13, 1, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns and seven heads with seven, 10 crowns on its horns and each held a blasphemous name. Now, is this the actual sea or the crystal sea? We don't know. Let's read on. Continuing on in verse six. <clears throat> in the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. So we've already been prepped of these four living creatures um, in the Old Testament. And they're most likely uh, what was recorded in Isaiah as seraphim, which we had read earlier, and, and are covered in much greater detail in Ezekiel chapters 1, 10, and 11, uh, which the scripture references there for you to, to uh, look up. However, in, in Isaiah 6, 2 through 3, let's just review that. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. And with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The majesty, the all-seeing aspect of these creatures because they're covered with eyes even under their wings. The obvious enormous power and majesty of these creatures. However, as far beyond as they are of human comprehension, they pale in comprehension in comparison to the Almighty God himself who sits on the throne. Another interesting thing is they all are different. Their different faces points to us that they're each individuals, their individuality. But one thing is certain, and that is their purpose in life is to worship God without ceasing. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Almighty. Now, how do we define holy here? You know, because normally holy is setting yourself as holy to God. And so holy there would be being separated, being set apart for God, but this is God. So in this context, it would mean that God is set apart from all creation because he is the creator. He transcends everything and everyone because they were all created by him. Another interesting thing is uh, we read holy, holy, holy in Revelation. We read holy, holy, holy in the Old Testament, like in Isaiah 6. Uh, both languages use the same formula. And what, that, what I mean here is that when they take a word and then they say it twice, it has a greater emphasis to it, okay? So holy is holy. 
Well, holy, holy is more holy or holier. Well, what is holy, holy, holy? Holy, 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 it calls a special attention to the infinite holiness of God Almighty. Now, we might, we might wonder, okay, we got these four living creatures. We got the 24 elders. Uh, they're worshiping God continuously, day and night, if, if we can say there's a day and night up there. Do they ever get bored? Does it ever get old? Let me ask you this. Do you ever get tired of watching a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise? And especially to those of us in Arizona that's known for just magnificent, spectacular sunsets. Do you ever get tired of that? And then stop and think, that sun is rotating around the globe and it is giving all of creation a show to see. Do we ever get tired of that? Or do we ever get tired of going out at night and seeing the Milky Way? I don't think so. And that just pales in comparison to what? the four living creatures and the 24 elders are seeing the magnificent grandeur of the Almighty God. So let's move on. Verse 9, <clears throat> whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay down their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our, lo our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. The 24 elders, I mean, as, as powerful and as highly esteemed as they are, this is the ultimate gesture of honoring God, their creator, as infinitely holy, infinitely worthy of their highest praise. And that should be how we receive God. We should give him our highest praise because he is worthy. Now, where it talks about by your will, they were created and have your being. So, so Father God, by your will, everything was created. And I'm reminded what we discussed earlier in Revelations chapter one. And once again, if you have not seen that, that video or, or attended that lecture, I highly recommend um, reviewing it. There towards the end, we took a 1 Corinthians 8, 6 and put it in a parallel format so we could grasp the magnificence and the, and, and the small difference between God the Father and God the Son, where it says there is one God, the Father, from whom, from whom are all things and we exist for him. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, by whom, by whom, not from whom, by whom are all things. And we exist through him. So for the Father, we exist for him. For, from, for the Son, we exist through him. Very, very important uh, theological truth there. So let's move on. Because that is the end of chapter four. Now we're gonna go into chapter five. And chapter five is incredible. What happens in chapter five? It's like an orchestrated coronation. Okay, something that has been put together. Everybody knows their lines. Uh, it is a formal event. 
very, very formal, very formal, which starts the fulfillment of what we have already read in the Old Testament. In particular, uh, two more important prophecies, Genesis 49, where uh, Jacob was blessing his, his son uh, Judah and his blessing turned into a prophecy where Jacob said, you are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. And like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah. Now remember, this is just a sign out in the middle of the wilderness, practically. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he, who's the he? He is the Messiah. He is the son of man to whom it belongs shall come and obedience of the nations shall be, shall be his. In Psalms 2, verse 7, I will proclaim Yahweh's decree. He said to me, now who's me? That's the Messiah. You are my son. Today, I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. <clears throat> the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them like pieces of pottery. So, the prophecies that have been shared with us, with mankind in the Old Testament, and what we read about in the New Testament gospels and from Jesus himself and from uh, the epistles and now from Revelation, scripture attributes supreme authority to God the Father, to Yahweh. It, but it's clear that his purpose is that Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ will rule the world. And that's what we're going to start to see fulfilled in Revelation. <clears throat> so let's start Revelation chapter five. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth, or under earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, John, do not weep. See, behold, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David. Now we've heard all about this in Old Testament prophecies. He has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So starting out with the mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice. Well, that sounds to me like a, like a scripted formal announcement of a coronation. John weeping and weeping. Uh, because no one was found as worthy to open the scroll. You know, obviously John didn't know what was going on, like the angels and the 24 elders. And in his mind, he's weeping out of frustration because that is what's required for God to go forward with his kingdom. And is it going to be postponed? How much longer are we going to have to wait until the scroll is open? And then, as we see, one of the elders said, don't worry, John, do not weep. This indicates to us further that this is a formal event. The elders knew exactly what was going on. They knew how this ceremony was going to go down. And then he says, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which we read about in Genesis, the root of David, 
which uh, we did not read this time, but we have in, in earlier lectures, found in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and uh, confirmed in Revelation 22. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, he has triumphed. This is prophecy being fulfilled. So John looks to see the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And what does he see? Verse six, then I saw a lamb looking at if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which, which uh, the, are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So let's unpack this. The lamb had seven horns. Seven is consistent in the Bible, representing completeness and perfection. Horns is also very consistent in the Bible, representing power. Some uh, references in Daniel 7 and 8 are given here. But in this case, it's not power like in Daniel of being kings or rulers and authorities. This is divine power, omnipotence, dominion of the almighty God. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. We've already talked about that, but it also is very indicative of his divine power of omniscience and omnipresence. And the fact that these seven spirits are sent out into all the earth, well, that tells us that they're not the lamb, they're separate from the lamb. Um, and we can go to John 16, where Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, now go away means he goes up into the throne room of God, right? The advocate, the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit about sin because people do not believe in me. Sad truth about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I want to read a, a commentary that's from the NIV application uh, commentary series because <clears throat> I think it's very significant and I just cannot put in any better words. Here, the central paradox of revelation and of the Christian faith in general comes to the fore. Jesus conquered, not by force, but by death not by violence, but by martyrdom. The lion is a lamb. Most significantly for John, this is a slaughtered lamb, a sacrificed lamb. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb delivered Israel from the climatic uh, plague that we found in Exodus, so Jesus' blood it will protect his people during God's judgments on humanity. And he references Revelation 7, 3. Jesus' victory is like a new exodus. Very interesting choice of words. And we will revisit that. And Jesus himself is the new lamb to be, to be compared with 1 Corinthians 5. Verse seven. So, in this pass, in this passage, verse seven, he, the Lamb, Jesus, went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. God the Father. He now presents a scroll that has seven seals on it. The New Testament word for "took" here is in the perfect tense, and we've discussed that in the past. But the perfect tense means that he's not only that he not only took the scroll, but it, he could also still be holding the scroll. What the scroll is called or what is written inside is not 
specifically explained. But we have enough, we see enough to have a good idea. Uh, the effect of the opening seal of its seals are very clearly described in Revelation ch chapter 6. The following are two similar possibilities that the first century Messianic Jews that are hearing uh, this being read to them uh, in the Jewish churches may have assumed from the scroll, one being a last will and testament, or, or it could be a title deed. What is it? Or what I would suggest, maybe it's God's master plan to take and restore his kingdom and to be done by the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at, at uh, some perspectives here. A last will and testament. Now during this time, first century AD, wills were written and sealed by six or sometimes seven witnesses. So that would give you your seven seals. And once it was determined that the person who made the will had died, and in this case, that would be the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, the seals could be broken thus opening and enacting the instructions in which the recipients of the will, that being the believers who accepted the atonement made by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, they can receive their inheritance. And what's their inheritance? It's the gospel, the good news, God's kingdom. That is eternal life, the tree of life, the living waters, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the complete package, uh, being part of the family of the Almighty God, sons and daughters, marriage of the Lamb. It just goes on and on. Another link to this line of thought is that the Messiah, coming from the line of Judah, is now claiming his inheritance that was prophesied to Judah in Genesis 49. Okay, let's look at the possibilities of a title deed. Title deed, when a man was, when man was created in Genesis chapter one, he was given immortal life and he was also given the earth, right? You could say that was deeded to him to have dominion over all its creation. So it was his land to govern, to rule over. I'm gonna quote another commentary. Now this is from Clarence Larkin's, his 1919 commentary title, Book of Revelation. And the, the bowls and the all caps, these are his words, not, not my additions. <clears throat> when Adam sinned, he lost his inheritance of the earth and it passed out of his hands into the possession of Satan to the disinheritance, disinheritance of all of Adam's seed, his offspring. Um, the forfeited title deed is now in God's hands and is waiting redemption. Its redemption means the legal repossession of all that Adam lost by the fall. Adam is impotent to redeem the lost possession, but the law found in Leviticus 25 provides that a kinsman, a kinsman may redeem a lost possession. And that kinsman has been provided in the person of Jesus Christ. To become a kinsman, he had to be born into the human race. He had to become a human being. This is the virgin birth accomplished by, accomplished. Jesus paid then the redemptive price, which was what? His own blood on the cross found in 1 Peter. But he has not as yet claimed that which he then purchased. When the time comes for the redemption of the purchased possession, Jesus will do so. And that time and the act is described in the scripture we are now considering in Revelation 5. Very interesting perspectives. Okay, let's look at the third, <clears throat> another thought. And that is scriptures foretell of God's plan of returning to destroy evil, judge, restore, rule, and reign. I mean, we've already been given that in prophecies. So maybe the scroll contains that plan held by the Father, which reveals the process and timing involved in his second coming. So let's kind of explore this. It's only after the lamb was slain that the scroll was even offered and could be opened. So Jesus' first uh, coming 
and his dying on the cross would be step one to purchase salvation. And this creates a way for mankind to become permanent residents of God's kingdom. Remember, the gospel is the kingdom is coming. And Jesus Christ is now providing a way into God's kingdom. Step two would begin with the handing Jesus the scroll that contains the plan, which contains what? The day and the hour of his coming. That secret, that mystery, which would explain why, in, for example, in Mark 13, we read that about the day, that day or hour, nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And why would that be? Because the Father had written it down into a scroll, rolled it up, and put seven steels on it so that nobody could see. Nobody knows the day or the hour. However, what we will see in the next chapter, chapter six, is that each seal, when broken, it starts a specific action of putting things into motion. However, the action that we see behind each breaking of an individual seal, this is not really God's judgment and wrath. This is the loosening of, of, of Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and, and, and just allowing men to make a mess of everything, all right? which we'll discuss. Uh, God's wrath, however, that's found in the trumpets. And the grand finale of God's wrath is found in the seven bowls that is poured out on the Antichrist and his kingdom. So those trumpets, those bowls, those timelines could very well be contained, sealed up in a scroll. Now, this is all speculation. We're not going to be dogmatic on any of this. But the bottom line is we're not told what is specifically written on the scroll. But we see what we see that has been recorded. And we can draw our own conclusions um, as to what it represents. So let's move on. Verse 8. <clears throat> and when he had taken it, so taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb. Each one had a heart and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sing a new song, which is ushering in a new chapter in the history of mankind, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased for God's persons from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. Not in heaven, on earth. The fact that the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb, that would have been a shock to the Jewish audience. This is Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, who died on the cross, who said he was the Messiah. He's receiving worship and prayers in God's heaven that's reserved for God alone. And this is coming from those whose purpose in life was to worship God continually. I mean, stop and think about it. If they were to make a mistake here, they're history, they're toast. That's their purpose in life. But no, this is all part of the plan. This is part of the coronation. Yeshua, Jesus, is co-equal with God the Father, Yahweh, the Ancient of Days. And these prayers that are being offered before the Lamb, what were these prayers? I don't think they were prayers like Susie praying for her Aunt Jane that uh, her broken arm will be mended without any complications. Something much bigger, a much bigger picture prayer. I would say maybe they are prayers from frustrated saints for God's kingdom to come. Remember how Jesus taught us how to pray. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's what's happening here. It may also be prayers from the martyrs. Those have been slaughtered uh, by evil people, evil rulers, evil governments, asking God to bring judgment, to vindicate them on those who are continuously committing these evil deeds and, and killings, which we'll read uh, later in the next chapter. But note this, how are these prayers received by God? As bowls full of incense, a pleasing aroma to God. And that should be an incentive and encouragement that we need to pray more. Pray more to God. Verse 11, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10, 000, times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Now, one thing that's interesting here is 10,000 was the largest number in the New Testament Greek language at that time. And it was probably John's way of just saying, hey, they're just beyond number. Thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Something very similar recorded in Daniel 7, verse 10, where it says a river of fire was flowing coming out from before him. This is in front of the throne. And thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So all this points to the majestic grandeur of God's throne room in the crystal sea, which is enormous. But something else, this is a perfect example of how to worship our Lord and God and Savior, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Many times when I'm worshiping God, I close my eyes and I just picture this throne room and I picture the four living creatures and the 24 elders and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels worshiping God. It helps me to, to as Jesus say, there'll be a time when I will be worshiped in truth and in the spirit. So I would highly recommend to really meditate on Revelations 4 and Revelations 5 and get that mental picture of what's going on, what's happening, and the majesty and the grandeur of the Lord our God. Okay, the last two verses in chapter 5. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So we have all creation worshiping God. I say all creation, obviously, Satan and the fallen angels are not. But all creation is worshiping God. And now the praise and worship is both to the Son, Yeshua, and to the Father, Yahweh. And to that, the four living creatures say, Amen. So be it. The coronation ceremony has now concluded. From now on, until Jesus' actual uh, second coming, his return back to earth, all decisions are going to be made by Yeshua, Jesus Christ, from the throne room. And we will also see that the prayers of the saints, they have an important role to play in all this as well. This should encourage each and every one of us to really step up our prayer life. Pray with more earnesty than ever before. Come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, my friends, concludes chapters four and five. And in chapter six, we will start with the removing of the seven seals on the scroll. So until then, God bless.